my editor was asking about how to adapt cities to heat, oh. and that's actually your job. Uh, so my first question is, you are both chief heat officers. That's a fairly new oh. role. Well, well, Yvonne has a, a, a great chief heat officer to I'm work, work I'm for mayor. her, but she is the mayor. And okay, she's right. yes, but sorry. she's one of the, you're right, she's but one of the first mayors that actually placed the chief heat officer. That's right. Um, so I, I wanted to talk about this role, about the chief heat officer. It's fairly new. We, you know, every, every city has people dealing with urbanism or waste or um, finances, but heat is something relatively new. Um, so I will uh, throw my question to Yvonne first. Um, why don't you tell us what a chief heat officer does and why does it make sense that cities have one? Thanks very much. So um, about two years ago, uh, Freetown, along with Athens, joined an alliance called um, City Champions for Heat. And through the work that we were doing and the conversations we were having, um, and this was all working with the Arsh Rock Resilience Center, it became clear that heat is a silent killer that just doesn't get the attention. It's not like the sl mudslides and landslides, the storms um, that people can see. Um, and even when you have like a major drought, the focus is often not on that heat that's there all the time, it's, it's just rising and increasing. Um, and it, we felt that it was necessary to have somebody to focus on this. It's a killer, it's the, the data is now showing that heat kills far more people um, than any other climate-induced change, weather event. But no one is looking at the data specifically, no one's understanding it. In our city, for example, we've been able to now, because we have a chief officer, we've been able to now design specific mitigating strategies around that. So, so the value of the, of the person is the value of the focus. It means we can focus on heat. Perfect. And Yvonne, if I, um, Eleni, if I can ask you, um, you are kind of in the next step. There are now several chief heat officers in cities across the world, but you are transitioning into a new role of global chief heat officer. What does that mean and what will you be able to do under this new role? Um, so, yes, we have six chief heat officers. Um, Athens, Freetown, Sierra Leone, Santiago de Chile, uh, Miami-Dade, Miami -Dade, the first one, Monterrey in Mexico, um, Melbourne, Australia, uh, and Los Angeles. And it's all women, and uh, it, they are, uh, it's an amazing team. Uh, I, I'm, um, I've been in Athens for many years working on resilience, and I realized that heat is the most um, challenging uh, aspect of climate change that Athens is dealing with and will have to deal with. And as Yvonne said, very few people know about it and a lot of what I've been doing is raising awareness. And so I think of the role, of my role, in three distinct pillars. One is raising awareness. Um, the other one is preparedness, making sure that we put into place actions for the most vulnerable, that protect the most vulnerable. And the third one is the redesign, which has to do with what you guys were talking before of how do we make our cities um, which are now becoming more and more death traps, the way that they're built, how do we make them cooler? And, and um, because air conditioning spaces is just not going to cut it. It's not going to get us out of this mess. It's actually just making things worse. So um, I am now transitioning to the, to, to the um, UN Habitat in a more kind of global role, again focusing on cities, because cities are where the, the most, the impact is, is most felt and most importantly felt both on the human bodies, which right. as Yvonne said, you know, they're not mm -hmm. made for this type of heat, but also in the economies of our cities, which are impacted from heat, uh, in uh, violence in our communities, in uh, uh, even, even education we know that is affected from, uh, from uh, if, again, right. I think Yvonne can, uh, can speak on yeah. this as well. But the general idea is to, to have both an advisory role for mm -hmm. things that are happening in cities that might want to um, fold in heat, as well as an advocacy role within the UN um, environment agencies for um, 
uh, elevating mm -hmm. the heat. Perfect. Keep and it. you've you've referred to a few of the of the problems that that um, cities and chief heat uh, officers face. I was wondering um, first, Yvonne, and then Eleni, if you could talk about specific problems that you have seen and faced in your cities and a solution that that you applied to them. Okay, so my city of Freetown in Sierra Leone, in case you're wondering where that was, is really different to Athens. Um, but the heat challenge is the same. And to give you two examples, I think I'll use two examples because they're so pervasive. 60% um, of our population, of the women in our, in our city, work in the informal sector. They're traders. And most of that trading happens outdoors. You know, we don't have big covered markets. So if you think about a woman sitting from dawn to dusk um, in increasing temperatures, under sweltering sun, and very often because of the, you know, sort of the circular impact of increasing heat means water is less available. So you're thirsty and, in a, and, and unable to quench that thirst. And even if you were, it's still not healthy. Um, so so that's, that's like a snapshot of a problem. And many women, you know, suffering from kidney problems because of that de constant dehydration and, and not understanding and not knowing and actually not having a solution. A very simple solution um, that our chief head officer came up with after research, looking at other things that she's seen in other places, was to build canopies, heat-resistant canopies. So they look like car parks. Um, you know, the kind that you have this just metal frame and the shade. But not only do we have the shade to also help with economic productivity, there's solar light. So in the evening, the women can stay on longer. That's so simple, so easy to do, and yet so transformative. So that's a solution that we've been able to roll out into three markets. We have 42 markets. And when we talk about adaptation, we always have to talk about money because even simple solutions like that cost money. Um, and finding the money to deal with that is important. The second example I'll give, um, which is, really touches on every aspect um, of city life for us, is informal settlements. In as much as we have a big informal sector, we also have a pervasion of informal settlements. Over 35 to 40% of our residents live in informal housing. And the most common structure, material used, is corrugated iron. I'm sure you've seen pictures. Mm. Think of corrugated iron in the blistering heat. It's literally like being cooked. Yeah. Um, so the heat, the impact of that not just on women, but on children, on the elderly. So the work that we're doing includes and involves actually doing upgrades of communities, which means coming up with heat resistance, cooling designs and materials. And it doesn't take a rocket science to know that if you're wanting to provide that kind of housing for over 300,000 people, that's a lot of money. So that's a solution in the making we're starting with a pilot in one community, but to roll that out really needs more resource. And, and this sort of comes to a bigger <laughs> challenge of where is the money coming from and how fast can the money move to adapt to climate change? I really like that you raised this issue because it's actually one of the laws on damage uh, and, and climate finance is one of the things that people talk the most here at, at this COP. And you know, here you have a live example of where that money can go to and what can be used for. Um, can you, uh, I can't Lenny, talk that. Can you, I can't talk Yvonne, but I'll say but, but a little Athens, bit of what Athens, Athens is doing. Athens does have yes. its own challenges, and you've talked about yes. vulnerable people, uh, elder uh, the women, children, and I'm sure um, they face challenges in Athens as yes, well. Yes, absolutely. Right? So, uh, just last, last year, not this summer, the summer before, we had a, a heat wave that lasted for over three weeks, and it was over, it, it reached uh, 45 degrees Celsius. And um, there were also peri-urban fires, and most of the media was focusing on the fires because they are more visible mm -hmm. and they're more, and of course they were right because there was so much uh, a forest burned three times as much as the average. But anyway, I'll, uh, anyway what, what, what we're doing in Athens, um, I just want to say that, that what Yvonne was, was talking about, the fact that you know, we need to really mobilize 
uh, uh, finances for adaptation, and especially for heat, is really, really crucial. And we have so many cities right now um, that are already suffering with temperatures that we can't even imagine. Mm. Um, and, and, and we really need to move fast because, it, um, you know, we, we're talking about 350 cities now facing um, temperatures above 35 degrees Celsius, and we expect in the next two decades that it's going to be a thousand cities that are facing really, really crazy temperatures and wow. 1.6 billion people. And a little bit more than a billion people of those are, are living in informal settlements. So this mm -hmm. is like a really urgent issue and it's not going away. But I'll quickly go to Athens and I'll be really fast. So in the preparedness and the, uh, in the awareness raising and preparedness, what we did, we piloted this last summer, was a new categorization system that we work with the Ars Rock Resilience Center. They have a team of scientists that work with the Athenian scientists. And they created a categorization system which takes, looks back at what kind of temperatures have been sitting specifically onto Athens for two decades and what kind of mortality data we had and co correlates this to create three categories. So now uh, um, decision makers and policy makers can actually look at the category and understand the percentage of risk on human life that you have per each category, which I think is groundbreaking. And also mm -hmm. Seville, which did the same uh, with Athens, the same uh, categorization, was the first city to start naming, naming heat waves, heat waves this, yeah, last this, summer. this last summer. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first named uh, heat wave was Zoe. Yeah. And, and so this was important. And I didn't think that, and I didn't think that mm. but then my daughter called me. That's a side thing. She lives in Norway, she's studying. And she called me and she said, Mom, I heard you are naming categories. And I said, well, yes, Seville is doing it. And she said, when I heard it, I started crying. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? And she said, because it kind of felt that we are going to, that it's here, that it's here to stay. And we're going to be dealing with it. And she knows I've been working with heat waves, but yeah. she started crying from the name. So I thought this is really significant. And I started thinking that naming is really really important. I, yeah, I was going to say, like, mm. it's some, it seems like a silly thing to just put a name to something. Yeah. It doesn't really change anything. It doesn't change the fact, but it does help yes. raise awareness. Yes. Um, and that actually um, goes very well with my next question, which, which was going to be, how do you engage with citizens um, to raise awareness, both about heat, but also about the actions that you're taking on the ground? What have you learned from your experiences in, in your cities? Um, in yeah. your case, Yvonne? Um, so the market shade covers I described were done with the market women. There were discussions with them. They helped design them. Um, in the three markets where they've been installed, they had to choose where. Um, and one of the things which has been so gratifying is that even though our resources that we had couldn't extend to the length of the market. The women said to us, how much does this cost? We can put some money together to try to extend it ourselves. Now that's not a burden we want to put on them with their own limited resources, but it shows the acceptance and the understanding. Um, so I think as with the question of the naming, the other thing that we're doing is we're, we're also working with scientists. We have a team that will be coming in, into Freetown in the next couple of months when the dry season starts. We're just going into the dry season now and we're expecting the temperatures to, to keep on rising. Um, but we're going to map heat islands. We know anecdotally where they are, um, but it will do two things for us. It will also help our reforestation drive. So we're, we're in the middle of a campaign called hashtag Freetown the Tree Town. We're planting and planting a million trees. We're planting a million trees and growing there, the trees. Is there tree. a tree fan down there? I think there was a tree <laughs> fan just there. <laughs> um, and the, the again, I, I know co clean cooking has also been discussed, yes. but the complexity of this is, I, I can easily just describe it as follows. So. We're planting a million trees, but 82% of cooking fuel in my city is wood or charcoal. And that's because people have no affordable alternatives. So you've got this dilemma um, and helping communities have the, build their resilience and, and the, the determination and commitment 
to protect their trees. Um, it's also helpful for them to understand and see the more direct link between their health outcomes and those trees. But it can't be done in isolation because no matter how well-meaning you are, if you've got to cook a meal for your family and there's nothing else you can use but wood or charcoal, you're going to cook the meal for your family and deal with the long-term consequences of the heat further downstream. So when we talk about our response as a global community, we've got to see the urgency of bringing these solutions, driving them forward together. And I won't stop talking about the need for the money. Yes. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's the key to the, to the problem, isn't it? <laughs> um, and, and how about in Athens or other, or other experience in, experiences in cities that you might have seen elsewhere? Um, you know, what, what can you t t uh, tell us about how to best engage with, with citizens? Um, well, for, for, um, it's very important, and a lot of cities do that. We were, um, we, uh, Athens is part of a couple of city networks, such as the Resilient Cities Network and the C40 Cities Network, uh, working together with ICLI as well. But we, 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 when, we try, when we started working with building resilience in Athens, we kind of learned that to build resilience, you really have to get the people with you. So we went through a... a for every major project that we do, we make sure that to, to, to start with asking the people and trying to understand, as Yvonne said, what is the issue? And so with, uh, uh, I can talk about a, a lot of different cities and very interesting things they've done because, for example, how do you approach the people that usually you can't have access to? So uh, some cities have gone into buses, into public transportation and started asking people in the bus or in the subway, like crazy places, so that you, because there's some populations that it's sometimes difficult to actually access. So we talk to a lot of different people, but for this particular case, I'll just get an example with how we built um, an early warning system this summer uh, attached to the, to the heat wave categorization. We first had uh, this workshop with all of what uh, were the vulnerable populations and different stakeholders around the vulnerable. So each table had like one was for the people that were the seniors that, uh, that live alone and the people that usually come in contact with them. Another was about immigrants, that there are too many immigrants often in apartments or that live in um, containers in, in um, camps in, mm -hmm. uh, around Athens. And that, uh, that's actually, I was going to say, that's a big issue in Greece that has received so much um, migration from, um, yes, and, from, and from the Middle East and Africa in the past. You're right, years. Laura. It, 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 was, it was a really big issue, especially a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Now we have the populations have, uh, are smaller because most people have wanted to leave. They didn't want to stay in Greece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we still have quite a few and uh, trying to get into the economy. Mm -hmm. uh, another, another group of people are the people that are homeless. Another vulnerable group is the people that are workers, that are outdoors, so we had mm -hmm. to talk with unions. And, and So you kind of speak with each of one, try to understand what the issues are, and then find the strategic, um, um, the strategic stakeholders or collaborators that can help you approach them and put things in, in, in effect. So for us, it was the Red Cross. Because, for example, um, the Red Cross is somebody that really people trust. So they go from they can go from door to door and go to the old people, you know, when they live alone in the and knock on the doors and check on them. And people open the door to the Red Cross and they feel safe with the Red Cross. And when they get information from the Red Cross, they trust it. So you have to find who are the the partners that the people can trust and how you can take the people with you and kind of uh, move with them to the different project mm -hmm. that you want to do. The, I mean, the other project, which I, I want, I'll just say a sentence, has to do with water, and I want to just put it in here because it's important. Each city has, and a lot of cities been doing that, uh, figuring out what is the water condition, how can right. we use water more sustainably, and how can we really use sources like sewage mining or figure out where we're really not using water mm -hmm. properly and start really thinking hard about how to do it. And we're dealing with an ancient aqueduct in Athens and stuff yeah. like that. So, so that's another big issue. I just wanted to make sure I put it yes. in here. That, the aqueduct project actually is really good. So um, Eleni was telling me about about it, how they're using an ancient Greek aqueduct to bring in fresh water into Athens and, and kind of freshen the city. Um, I want to um, open up uh, for questions, but before, um, before that, just very quickly, I wanted to ask you, um, Yvonne, what's next 
um, for the city of Freetown. Um, I know you've had some difficulties in your role. So, you know, nothing's a given, uh, you know, no, no path is straight. So what, what is the next challenge that you're facing? Um, what's next? And same uh, for you, Eleni, under your new role in the UN, if very quickly you could sum up, like, what comes next for you? And then we'll um, let the audience ask questions. Right, so um, the thing about climate, you know, we've got 17 SDGs and number 13 is climate, but actually to me, climate sits under everything because it's affecting everything. Um, our population's increasing rapidly because rural urban migration is going off the scale as farming populations in rural areas are struggling to uh, maintain a living, you know, they're moving into the city. So the pressure on infrastructure um, means that you've got pressure on housing, which I've already described is so informal. For that same reason, those informal settlements are increasing. You've got transportation challenges. We have no mass transit. Um, our solution to that is we're seeking to implement a, for the first time ever, a cable car system based on the model in Medellin which will introduce green public transit, connect communities, increase productivity, but all of this against a backdrop of an increasing population, more challenges with deforestation, increasing heat, more challenges on the health sector. Um, and one of the biggest sort of gaps we have in our urban management as a city is that bizarrely, even though the legislation provides for it, the city does not have the mandate to do land use planning or issue building permits. They're done by the central government, which means they're not done. So there is there's just madness. <laughs> um, so what's next is a continuation of advocacy to change that because the urgency of the moment cannot be overstated. There has been no time in which being able to plan for this future this future of climate and all that comes with it could be more important. So that's something that I've really got my eyes fixed on. And as you said, it's been challenging. But I believe that this is where the global community comes in. I've been saying for some time now that when we talk about climate change and we look at the national governments, the NCDs, NDCs that they're submitting, there's got to be accountability. There's got to be accountability and there's got to be a closer, uh, bringing, bringing the rhetoric and the reality closer together. That gap has to close. And, and in my city, there's no better way to do it than to go into those thorny areas of legislative mandates, you know, advocate, advocating um, for city leaders to have the space they need to do the work that has to be done. Awesome. And if, uh, sorry, um, yeah. Lenny, because I, I, we've <laughs> got just a couple That's of minutes fine. left. No, That's, That's okay. fine. We can do a um, question. Yes. Right? Let's, let's let the couple. audience ask, ask questions, please, because... My mic. Uh, can historic buildings be modified to incorporate passive low energy heat control designs or does building material require a complete revision in order to enhance temperature regulation? Who wants to take that? It's <laughs> a good question. Often historic buildings are better than modern buildings. So historic, it depends on the historic building. It depends which historic building and in which part of the world. But you know, we, we because, okay, we, we, using concrete and uh, the, the way we've been uh, building, building yeah. our cities, which is basically with concrete, cement, asphalt, glass, and steel, is, has been really depending on fossil fuels and the idea of uh, endless resources, right? Especially fossil fuel that we can do anything because we can just burn fossil fuel. So we have forgotten how to really build things. Mm. So, so um, if, we, if we get older buildings, sometimes they are better because they have smaller openings, for example, or they have thicker walls and they can function better. Uh, if we start kind of thinking of older things like whitewashing buildings outside, like they used to do in my country, in the Greek islands for the summer, or uh, he, in, in, in uh, Arab countries where you have like these incredible internal courtyards and stuff. But the materials, because, so I'm not answering exactly the question, <laughs> But the materials are really important and uh, we can retrofit. We can always retrofit. 
Uh, we can also, there's like incredible technologies that are creating new types of materials that can be used. Uh, we just have to step it up and there are people that are really looking for um, uh, um, investments for things that are already starting to be piloted that uh, we're really excited about. And I, I wish I had more time to, <laughs> to answer more into this. I think this one's for the mayor and I think that I know your answer will be, but if there was one thing that you could see come out of this cop, what would it be? Money. That, <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. Yeah, definitely. Real money, <laughs> not commitments, disbursements. And fast. And fast, and to the global south. Yes, and to the global south. Only 4% of all the adap adaptation financing so far has gone south. Um, and that needs to change. All right. Thank you so much, um, Yvonne, Eleni, for being here with us today. Um, it's been a great discussion, been great to hear you. Thank um, you. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>